Zero. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, dear Dr. Frank Richter, Chairman of Forasis, uh, we are starting our session uh, dedicated uh, to the exploration and trade and investment between India and the Greater Caspian region. Uh, I'm Murat Sietnikesov uh, from Caspian Week and the Greater Caspian Association. I will uh, briefly explain what does it mean Greater Caspian region. It's not only five literal states of the Caspian Sea. Here we are talking about the bigger region. Some uh, somebody calling this region Eurasia, but uh, it is uh, uh, Caspian Sea states, Central Asia, including Afghanistan, even north of Pakistan, Caucasus, Black Sea, and countries surrounding the Black Sea. Uh, 500 million people, 10 million square kilometer, three trillion dollar GDP. And uh, on the other side, we have India, 1.4 billion people, uh, and uh, potentially now for today's, uh, I think, third biggest economy in the world, and potentially could be second, even first, after some years. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, uh, the Ambassador Sham Batia. Uh, he is originally from Afghanistan. Uh, he was uh, serving in the government of Ahmed Karzai as the senior minister and senior advisor for economic affairs. Also, he was ambassador of Afghanistan in various countries. Uh, then we have Rakesh Gaur, uh, who is the president for railway division, but also responsible for the uh, solar energy, uh, power transmission. Uh, in the Kolpataro group of companies with operations in more than 50 countries. And uh, he spent uh, over a decade in the Greater Caspian region, in particular in Kazakhstan. Uh, uh, and he has a great experience in the region. Uh, then we have Gunara Salimova. Uh, she, she is trying to join. I think will join us later. Uh, she's the president of the Swiss-Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce and official representative of Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Switzerland. And uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Claude Bigle, uh, former chairman of the Swiss Post, former vice chairman of DHL and CNT, uh, former national, uh, member of the National Parliament of Switzerland. And uh, why we invited him, he is particularly important for our session because he developed a very interesting business model in India, uh, bringing Swiss innovations and sw Swiss know-how to India and starting producing disinfection water, uh, machine dis disinfection of water, uh, dis uh, producing disinfection liquids, sorry. And uh, he will explain in details about uh, his business, but for me it was very interesting to hear how he started that business and apparently this business was started on one of the Horasis India events some years ago. Uh, and how it was developed, uh, with challenges, with problems he faced, and uh, he will tell himself. Uh, now, uh, I would like uh, to give a floor to Rakesh Gaur. Uh, he is also uh, vice chairman of the Central Asian Committee of the Confederation of Indian Industry. Uh, he is uh, really important for these relations. And uh, he had uh, business with many of the countries of the Greater Caspian region. I would like to give a floor to him and ask uh, uh, him how Indian businessman was able to develop successful business in the Greater Caspian region, with challenges uh, and obstacles he faced, how he managed to sort this out, and uh, also some advices for the other Indian businessmen, how to develop business in the Greater Caspian region. Please, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murad. And good day to all my distinguished panelists, as well as to the uh, audience. It is really a proud moment for me to share the dais with such a distinguished personality. My journey in Central Asia started by travel to Kabul. And from the Kabul, it was a time of 2003, when the restructure was taking place. A lot of movement was being done in the country. And we traveled from Kabul to mazar sharif to review a possibility of construction of line from Hiratan to Uzbek Uzbekistan uh, border to connecting it to through Fule Khumri and uh, bringing it to the Kabul side. Both the, uh, if we see Central Asia region or Caspian region, there is a connectivity is uh, such that culturally we are very strongly connected with the, each other. A uh, ma'am from Uzbekistan is there. I have traveled across the Central Asian countries and I have not found any country 
where the people are not singing Khatuba from Ali Baba Chalish Chor. So such a connectivity, the civilization from both the countries has taken place and in spite of close relationship, we are not able to really explore the possibility of the trade. The reason is, main is connectivity. So if we see from the close relationship, both the market, why this several count India for India, this market is very, very important is for energy security and a gateway to CIS as well as from the Europe. The region is very rich in minerals, especially hydrocarbons. Consumer market is still to be explored. And lot of countries in the Caspian area are also needed for geopolitical stabilization of different, different situations. If we see complementary actions, resources, manpower and market, all are complementary. We have resources, there is a market, we have manpower, there is a potential to work on that area. Now, the challenges which we have faced is, uh, from the start days is first of lack of direct connectivity. From 2003, I am seeing the connectivity is becoming a major challenge and as soon as the political situation change, the connectivity also becomes a very, very serious issue. There is no direct connection. One connection is through Pakistan, which is always challenging. If we have to go to Kandhar side, we enter from Chaman border. And if we enter to go to Jalalabad, we have to enter through the Peshawar side. For the time, this is always a challenging and generally cargoes are not going through Karachi port to these two areas. So we have no choice but to go to Bandar Abbas. When we go to Bandar Abbas, we have a challenge of restrictions. That if we move the cargo of any funding agencies where the embargoes are there on the Iran, and when we move the cargo through the different route via Turkmenistan, we always face a problem of billing, discounting, and merchandising issues. So first of all, the problem is lack of direct connectivity. The second thing which comes out to be that issue with the banks, when you fund any, uh, any route or any movement without China through Kundigo port, you find difficulty issues with the banks because banks don't want to face any problem with OFAC. They always try to see the document should be clean, the cargo should be clean, moved from without any restrictions. And there is an intense competition for energy resources. Uh, I have uh, personally involved in the project which was from Ekbas to, to Chu, that means north-south connector of Kazakhstan. Because Ekbas to region is a very, very uh, coal area where a lot of power plants are there and the power has to come through 500 kV line up to the uh, Chu area, then it can go to Uzbekistan and other areas. But we find that for taking that material, ultimately we have to go through the Dostik, through the China and from China to uh, entering in the border. This makes logistically very, very challenging situation. And energy competition is, is such a way that US, Russia, China, all three are trying to uh, see whatever best way politically, geopolitically, diplomatically, <coughs> through financing to control this area's resources. There is an investment climate barrier. The region is not very investment friendly. Uh, there, there is a success for Indian companies in Kazakhstan. We are the pharmacy of the world. But still, we are not able to push the product because, first of all, the logistics. Second thing, the kind of rules, regulations, and transparency which require to operate an investment environment is very, very challenging. We feel that to attract the FDA, conducive policy and prerequisitions are very actively needed in this direction from most of the countries. Uh, we have we have done generally project which was funded by multinational agencies and we did a project in Georgia, connecting Georgia, Turkey, and that was a different voltage level. So 500 kV to 400 kV, there was a class K, there was a HVDC project that has been put. Uh, I personally have uh, connected Tajikistan uh, to Afghanistan uh, through the Sangtuda and from that Sikhan Bandar uh, through the connectivity of the line. We have also seen connecting uh, Kyrgyzstan, connecting a project from Turkmenistan to Iran on the railway side. But the challenge mainly comes is that local rules, documentation and the banking procedures are very, very rigid. In spite of USSR collapsing 30 years back, certain uh, rules and regulations of that era is still continuing. 
Another major problem is visa and air connectivity. There is a land connectivity issue. Same time, there is an issue about visa and taking the manpower. Regarding the manpower, uh, sir, is uh, uh, here. Uh, when we entered Afghanistan in 2003, we have taken approximately 800 people from India to construct the transmission line and substations. And today, I can proudly say that uh, before this political turmoil, uh, we were having only 40-50 people managing various projects. The reason is very simple. The local skill set has developed. Local people has developed the competency to maintain, competency to construct, competency to understand, and a lot of education and development has gone for the local youth. So that was that is the sign which we say. In Kazakhstan also, we were very vocal for the local. What we have done is we have uh, put all the local contractors and local manufacturing in place. Only thing the project management capability has been built up by us, and the project has been done ahead of schedule. To enhance the credit line, most of the country should try to pull out all the resources to increase the credit line so that projects move from one country to another country. That is the another challenging area. And what India can offer to these countries is healthcare services. I have seen a lot of people from Afghan, Kazakh, Uzbek, other people, they come for health services here. So what we can do, we can develop the health services there. Height services can also be developed, although we know that Armenia... Uh, where we have connected, it is not directly coming to the Caspian side, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Armenia side. We have also tried to develop certain IT facilities. Travel and tourism can be developed, consultancy can develop. And the energy and construction project where we, India, have a large experience, considering the volume which we handle, uh, power, water, railway, highway, roads, etc. can be tried out. Air education services, a lot of people go to Europe, some of you are not able to afford that kind of cost. They can come to India for higher cost or we can put the institutions there. Training and skill development of the local people, especially all the Istans, Uzbek, Kyrgyz, Tajik in that area. And create a business climate. To create the business climate, lot of interactions are required. My congratulations to uh, Mr. Murat for seeing that it is... It is organized in this way that we are able to interact, we are able to learn from each other to find out what best can be done to cooperate. So this was from my side. I will be ready for all the questions. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Rakesh. Thank you for the very interesting and optimistic and enthusiastic presentation because we, as, as we see, there are really a lot of possibilities to do business between India and the Greater Caspian region. And... Uh, I think we will go for the questions after the all speakers uh, the speeches, uh, and then uh, yeah, I think we are also trying to connect. But I would like to invite Shambatia uh, to continue discussion uh, because uh, situation in Afghanistan is very and vitally important for the whole region. And uh, I'm originally from Turkmenistan. We have a border with, with Afghanistan. And uh, there are many other countries uh, like uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Iran, Pakistan. They have borders with, with Afghanistan. And uh, all of us, we see what, what is happening there. Uh, there was a very good positive movement uh, one year ago. But unfortunately, now uh, we see uh, some kind of deterioration of the situation. Uh, but anyhow, we know this is all this is a temporary problem. And uh, on the long term perspective, uh, Afghanistan is the transit country for the trade between India and the Greater Caspian region. And Rakesh already highlighted some projects. And I'm surprised that he was in 2003 in Kabul and Mazajar Sharif just uh, beginning. <laughs> it, it, it is very interesting. And um, uh, we are expecting good news from Afghanistan peacemaking process, uh, but uh, today we are concentrating on the economic relations and what could be done, uh, how uh, business in Afghanistan and India, so businessmen in Afghanistan do business together, but also how they could facilitate trade uh, between India and the Greater Caspian region. Please, Sham. Thank you. Good morning to you, Murat and Rakesh and all colleagues and friends and participants. It's really a pleasure. First of all, I congratulate you that you, with all the COVID restrictions and the issues that we are facing now, 
you are still able to put a good session together. This is fantastic, and thanks to you and Frank. That uh, Horatius is doing a very well job. Rakesh has highlighted uh, many logistics and then uh, operational issues which face India uh, in, the, in, in this trading relationship with all the region, basically. Uh, of course, I overview, I will say, uh, India's trade relation, our expansion, is basically into two parts. One is the political and one is this economic as well as uh, uh, transit issues, for example. Political, of course, Murad, yesterday we had a we wrote a book together yesterday, <laughs> and we could continue to do so, develop on those all these political issues, which face not only the Caspian region, but the whole South Asia region, and plus, plus, plus with it, and so on. But coming back to, to this transit trade issue, which is really heart of the whole thing, uh, India has invested very heavily in Afghanistan, which Afghans very much appreciate it. In my capacity, as I went many times, um, an official visit to, to New Delhi, and I, we met a very big delegations. And at that time, for example, Prime Minister Balmohan Singh, we talked to, to, to him and so on. We appreciate what India has done for Afghanistan. And it's not only, of course, it's a long hundred years uh, of relationship which exists between India and Afghanistan based on that. But more important also, India's economic and trade interest in the country. Big projects, big money, big resources, and so on, uh, which India has, for example, the iron ore issues and so on. However, the recent changes, or I would say not only the recent, but continued difficulties that Afghans are facing with the, the transit issues, it's not today, it's, it has been since 1946, 47, I could say even, even uh, that, that, that far. We have realized and we have been very sort of, you know, proactive and in, in sort of trying to do our best with Pakistan to, 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 to get together and build a relationship. And because the trade benefits both parties, not only us, uh, all parties basically is concerned. So within that context, I was part of the team of the, which we negotiated the AFPAC, we call it, Afghanistan-Pakistan Trade Agreement, which was basically fully supported by at uh, that time, um, Secretary Clinton, for example, and it went through, and the, the AFPAC agreement is signed. Within the AFPAC, AFPAC agreement, one of the key elements was that Pakistan would open the Lahore Waga border for the, for the transit goods. And if that happens, that solves one of the biggest problems. You go through Waga and then you just continue to Afghanistan and continue to the whole Kashmir region, for example. Now, because of this current situation, or in the past few years, the situation that Daga border is not the way functioning the way it should be functioning. So that is one area which I think, at some point, the region, as well as India, as well as us, all of us, should really work more again and build on already in something which is already agreed upon. That's the APAC. So that is one thing we will benefit considerably by, by, by going to it. That's number one. And number two, India also has an advantage. Uh, while Afghan current situation, Taliban's and all kinds of things are just creating more difficulty. But mind you, India has invested, and it's a very rightful investment, in Chabahar port, which is in the Iranian side. Now, Chabahar in, in Zaranj area and then in, in Kandahar area, it's a very small road. It is not like thousands of kilometers. It's a few hundred kilometers. And that is also being built now. If that comes out somehow utilized, that will be fantastic. But if not, which in the current situation, who can go to Kandahar and, and put the trucks in and put it to Zaranj and to, to, to Chabahar. But there's a direct um, uh, uh, sort of ship which carries from Bombay or Calcutta or any other point, for example, directly to Chabahar. Now, Chabahar may not have that capacity of bigger ships and bigger, you know, vessels and so on. But nevertheless, there exists a place, there exists a mechanism which one can regularly, again, build on it and then go further on, 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 on that part. So that is number two area which I was thinking of it. Uh, I think one can, one can really work on it. Now, of course, this is, we are doing our best in Afghanistan, but if, if they listen to it, but of course, with India's support and the region's support. 
Now, the Afghan issue, I am more and more concluding, which I have already used to say that, it's not only Afghan issue. It's the region issue. It's the whole Caspian Central Asian issue. So we all have to sort of chip in or put our sense together and make things this successful. Uh, because end of the day, rightly or wrongly, it is the most expensive real estate in the whole region, basically, the Afghan side. So one has to capitalize and contribute and make sure that everybody benefits from it and, and so on. So that is another area which I, I call upon and I invited and during my meetings, during my visits to all these countries, that the Afghan issue should be a little bit taken care of also by the whole Caspian region. And finally also, Turkey has an important role to play, uh, which is just starting now. Uh, of course, that Turkey being a former member of, or still member of the NATO forces, um, they were there for, to protect the Kabul airport. They were a little bit in a non-competent sort of situation with Taliban. But I think if they could maintain that aspect, it would be very helpful. And Turkey can use some influence, not necessarily in Afghan, because we have very close link to them as well. And furthermore, the whole region, for example. That is another area which one can really look into it. But I think we should work closely all in the region for the Afghan situation, which temporarily is, is not in a in a state of, you know, acceptable position. Uh, we are going through quite a bit of difficulty because it's not only Afghanistan in the region, tribalism and so on. The moment you throw somebody out of your head, then you say, I'm winner. I'm the one who won the war. But this is not, it's a something which is only media level issues that is coming up. But I hope we will be all able to put together, put together. With, with the help and the full participation of India, uh, as well as uh, Pakistan, hopefully, and all of the other region to make Afghanistan trade work. Because trans Afghanistan transit is issue are very important for us and, of course, for, for, for everybody else. The connectivity issue, which India is facing some difficulty now, that could be a little bit work out on that, that line. The rest of the logistics already... Rakesh has kindly explained everything anyway, day to day, and we can work on it. We'll start with that. Thank you. Thank you, Sham. Uh, just one comment for the speaker. When uh, you are not speaking, just put your microphone on mute. Otherwise, sometimes we're getting echo. Uh, no, I... <laughs> oh, only if you are not speaking. Uh, uh, now I would like uh, to invite Gulnara Salimova. Uh, unfortunately, her internet connection is not uh, very good to support also in video and uh, audio, but uh, we will uh, get her voice, but we will see only this uh, Uzbekistan Swiss Chamber of Commerce logo here. Uh, and uh, Gulnara, uh, initially, uh, after graduation uh, in, Uzbe in Uzbekistan, she was working for the government of Uzbekistan. Then she moved to Europe and then to Switzerland. Uh, she was a top manager of the various companies, in, uh, multinational co companies responsible for the regional countries and the region. Uh, in, uh, since 2010, uh, she is the president of uh, Switzerland-Uzbekistan Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Uzbekistan is a very important country for the region. First of all, there are 35 million people living there. Uh, second, uh, uh, all the 35 million people are really hardworking, and there is a very, very great potential. And thanks to the reforms of the President Mirziyoyev, uh, which were started in 2016, and uh, constantly and sustainably moving uh, already for five years. Uh, and we see that the business climate uh, was really improved. Uh, because I'm uh, quite regularly there. Uh, we have also business in Uzbekistan. And uh, each time I was coming to Uzbekistan, each six months, the situation was significantly improved. And uh, the, at the last trip, which was just before COVID, I saw that uh, already uh, ministers and deputy ministers uh, started to speak English, which was a very big surprise how in this short time they managed to get English uh, language. And uh, we see a really uh, good development. And uh, uh, I would like to ask Gulnara to explain uh, the perspectives, uh, the improvement of the uh, business climate and investment climate, which projects are possible, and with the focus on the potential cooperation between India and Uzbekistan. Please, Gulnara. Yes. Um, 
Good day to everyone and to participants and to uh, honored speakers. Um, I would like to uh, emphasize Uzbekistan, as you know, geographically located right in the middle of the Central Asia. Um, seven international corridors and further corridors are being developed uh, in terms of transportation and connectivity of Uzbekistan to the uh, neighboring countries and uh, countries of CIS and Far East. Um, Uzbekistan has historically developed a very close ties with uh, Indian uh, economy and Indian entrepreneurs. There are lots of Indian companies that uh, historically present in Uzbekistan since 70s. And uh, after Uzbekistan became independent, those ties started to develop even more in all aspects, in the economic tra trade relationships, as well as uh, tourism, as well as uh, cultural aspects. And uh, obviously, as it was emphasized before by panelists, uh, the potential is not yet reached. Uh, obviously, turnover, uh, trade turnover, which exists between two countries, is developing progressively, however, not exploring the full potential which exists between Indian uh, enterprises and Uzbek enterprises and what both economies can offer for each other. Um, there are several industries in which Uzbekistan is keen to develop economic ties with India one of which is pharmaceutical sector. As you know, in Uzbekistan, we have seven free economic zones just for this industry. And given the COVID setup and COVID pandemic situation, India and Uzbekistan can really develop together certain vaccines, be it against COVID or any further threats in terms of new viruses coming up. Um, I know that uh, pharmaceutical relations are being developed as well as medical sector is also very much uh, developed between two countries. Lots of uh, patients go to India for uh, medicine. Okay, looks like connection even... Ah, okay. We lost Gulnara. I think she will be able to rejoin again. Uh, okay, meanwhile, uh, also Dr. Begle having problems. Uh, he's actually now in India. I don't know. He joined for just before the session, and now he's. Uh, we cannot get him back. Uh, but I think should be fine. Uh, meanwhile, uh, while we're waiting for them to connect, uh, I would like uh, do, so, to do several comments. Uh, first of all, I already told about Uzbekistan, about the business climate, investment climate improvement, about the reforms of the, uh, of the government. Uh, also, we see a good positive development in Azerbaijan, in the region. Uh, they created one window service called Asan service. And uh, you can really fast in the more or less few hours to register the company, register the business and do a lot of uh, bureau uh, bureaucratic procedures ju just in hours. And before it was the, uh, it was possible to spend like weeks for this. And this also helping uh, because when the foreign businessman is coming to the country, uh, he would like to do everything fast. He's not able, especially now during the COVID time, uh, to spend weeks for the very simple things. And uh, we see very good development in, in Azerbaijan. And also they are creating free trade zone and free industrial zones in Azerbaijan uh, with a very moderate and uh, good uh, tax regime. Uh, also, we see in Kazakhstan, uh, there is Astana International Financial Center uh, who accepted English law and English arbitration uh, for the resolution of disputes. And this is also vitally important and a very good uh, innovation uh, which was brought to the region. Uh, because the other problem is that uh, when the foreign businessman is coming, he has no idea about the local law and local regulations. And uh, if he or she doesn't know, then he or she afraid to do something. 
And here, if you know that uh, all your contracts, all your potential uh, issues or disputes will be uh, governed by the English law and English arbitration, uh, arbitration and uh, actually English judges are coming uh, to arbitrate and uh, make the decisions on the disputes uh, to Astana. And uh, this is also very good development. And uh, also important uh, to mention Georgia, uh, because they really digitalized uh, the government, the, uh, the economy, even the official letters recently I saw, they are uh, now coming in the digital form, without real signature, with a digital signature. And very fast, very effective. And uh, Georgia is a traditionally very innovative country. Uh, that's why there are really good countries uh, with a good investment and business climate where Indian investors could come and do business. Uh, I can continue the list, but this is probably uh, the most attractive destination for the Indian business. And uh, as we saw, that uh, really potential is great uh, between the region and India. Here, where I am not talking about the country by country, I am talking about the whole region because uh, uh, and. Uh, there is also good potential for bilateral uh, cooperation, uh, but also for multilateral cooperation. Uh, like, uh, okay, now Gulnara joined us back. Gulnara, please continue. We lost you like three, four minutes ago. Uh, please. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I spoke all that time and I don't know where you, you, you dropped. I dropped myself from the line. Uh, um, so I was yeah, talking uh, about uh, I think uh, potential lo 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 development of the bilateral relations between India and, and Uzbekistan in many, many industries, such as space, aviation, um, Indian companies ex expressed interest in uh, um, being involved in the project of of airports uh, construction and reconstruction in Uzbekistan, uh, textile industry, pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceutical industry has seven free economic zones, as I mentioned, and uh, obviously with the uh, uh, medical sector also being developed, uh, Indian companies can control. Um, also, I mentioned that uh, uh, Uzbekistan has uh, several international corridors that connect uh, Uzbekistan with many, many countries of uh, uh, Europe, uh, CIS, and uh, Far East. Gulnara, I think you already, okay, off, yes. Uh, okay, this is the beauty of the virtual meetings. <laughs> Nothing is guaranteed. <laughs> different countries, different internet connections, different problems and so on. Uh, okay, and that's why all of us were really missing live meetings and uh, we very hope that uh, Frank Richter will be able to arrange a live meeting maybe uh, for for Asia's Asia or maybe for the next year as soon as possible. Okay, uh, Gulnara, can, can you hear me? Gulnara? No, looks like no. Okay, uh, meanwhile, uh, Gulnara, please uh, maybe exit and... Yeah, yes, now, now is okay, now is okay, please. Well, I, I don't know where you lose me because I continue to speak and then I don't know where I lose uh, you. So, <laughs> I don't know, uh, you I start message you, you, about, you, you uh, hear me. Uh, you said, uh, I, I, I've heard the uh, medical, me medicine and so on. You started about bilateral relations with Uzbekistan India, started to explain. Then came to the medicine and uh, but are you, okay, no, looks like very difficult. Okay, uh, <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, I, a, I think it's... Uh, it's, it's please please it's, continue. Uh, you have now good connection. I see the green color. Uh, go ahead. Okay, okay. So um, it's extremely important to emphasize that uh, India... And uh, relationships have, uh, 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 the IT sector, agricultural sector, textile sector, Okay, Gulnar, we are uh, missing you again. There is a, I think it's a bad connection. It's a red sign. Okay, uh, then uh, uh, we will wait when Gulnar will establish connection. Now let's uh, go Develop to the business questions. In Uzbekistan, uh, and, including oh. energy sector, including okay. pharma sector. So all the relationships. No. Okay. Uh, let's start with Sham now, the reverse order. Uh, what will be your recommendations uh, for the governments, uh, for the private business, uh, for the financial institutions uh, in the Greater Caspian region and India, uh, like main uh, bullet points, uh, how to develop uh, trade, economic and investment relations between the region and between India? And then we will uh, go also to Rakesh. Thank you. <clears throat> we try to see that internet is, although it is the key pillar of the whole thing, but nevertheless it's having problems. Well, Gulnara speaking from Zurich, it should be good in principle, but nevertheless it's, uh, it can happen. Uh, a lot could be done between India and the region, which I, what my, um, uh, limited exposure was, for example, the Indian embassy in Kabul, the commercial uh, attache, the commercial section of it, for example. They were organizing meetings uh, with us and explaining what India is doing and where do we need help. For example, one of the areas which I was speaking to ambassador there all the time, uh, particularly with the transit issues, that was a key thing. And of course, they're also constrained in that way. They cannot do much provided if there's no sort of international and regional support to pressure those countries which are in position to do and open the doors for us, for example. So that is one area which India could really work on that part, for example. Secondly, India can assist, which they, in, in, in the case of Afghanistan, which I saw, was doing that in the, in the enterprises development. Um, in, in, because once you have day-to-day -day contact with the chambers of commerce, with the um, uh, both countries together, then the issues come in and they can solve it at some point, and they will do so. That is another area which I think this advocacy type of role should be very, very important that one should uh, run for it. And secondly, of course, there's uh, India has a vast country and with vast resources, uh, economic resources, as well as the technical know-how. Maybe that may be another area that India could really vote in those countries, for example which will be very, very helpful. Now, in a little bit beyond that, this is the at, the at the bilateral level, India could really play a crucial role by literally organizing together meetings, uh, for example, in the, for the regional countries or regional institutions or regional individuals, uh, think tanks, to really move this issue together. I do recall this, we have discussed this issue also long ago with our Indian counterparts. I, I remember that at one point, way back when I was growing up, I used to hear, and I remember I was, I, I, I participated in some of the research on that. Uh, Prime Minister Shastri of India was meeting uh, pr uh, President of Ayub Khan in Tashkent, for example, at, at, at that time. So India was doing that kind of, innovative uh, movements, I think they should still continue. Um, the, the ministerial visits, the delegations visits to these countries should not stop because these open the doors to all the discussions and so on. That should, I think, another way to, to continue uh, with the region itself. Uh, bringing region into dialogue 
And that is the key thing. The Indian tank, think tanks, which I participated in, so many of them, have done a remarkable job. No question about it. But India is not a small country like Afghanistan. India is not a small country like any other. India is the power base. It's the region. They can afford much more to a little bit allocate resources toward that, that, that aspect. End of the day, they will benefit. And of course, the region will benefit too on top of it. That I strongly recommend. For example, we had spoke a few times at the Observer Institute in New Delhi. For example, President Karzai and myself, we were there many times. That that type of dialogue and linkages must continue, not at the political level, not on the academic level, but also at the all the commercial level. They should be very benefited. They should be very close contact, joint chambers of commerce creation, for example, India and Afghanistan, India and Turkmenistan, India and this, India. This will basically let, once the ball start rolling, and it will roll very fast. And I think that's what India may wish to at least consider that part. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Sham. Uh, Gulnara, maybe you will add uh, some words uh, to, your, to your speech, because we are now only four minutes for us left. And then I will give the floor to uh, Rakesh Gaur, uh, also for his ideas how to improve the cooperation. Gulnara, please. Yes, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, India and Uzbekistan have very close ties historically, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, several uh, business corridors, I mean, transportation corridors and logistical hubs mm -hmm. and everything could be enabled for the joint venture setup, for the tr exploring more trade. Uh, okay. Uh, Rakesh, please, then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, these kind of challenges comes, but uh, relationship continues and we have to force uh, that development continues. I think last uh, few years, uh, 10 to 50 years, a lot of things has been done, whether it is for Afghanistan, whether it is, you know, uh, BRICS is taking place, SCOs meetings are continuously taking place, prime minister visits are happening. And if you see recently, even foreign minister visits are happening. And we as a uh, Indian community on the business side is very, very keen to see that this dialogue continues. Problems will come. Challenge will come. You, if you see uh, CASA is going on uh, in spite of all the challenges, uh, which is last seven to eight years, Central Asia to South Asia power transmission line is going on. Some connectivity when it has been improved in Tbilisi, Baku, NK on Turkey side, uh, the, it has facilitated a lot of you know petroleum products movement. If the, another railway line which has been connected between the three countries has also moved a lot of things. So we are uh, very hopeful that the as Sir has suggested that dialogue should continue, meetings should happen, environment should be created to sign a lot of uh, understanding memorandums on the commercial side and product movement at any cost must be moved. It may be a challenging one. I remember when we were doing Jalalabad, uh, the, we moved the things through Pakistan in spite of all the problems. Uh, yes. Whether we have to hire a Pakistani contractor or a transporter, but it has to be done. So similar way, if we are we were working in Georgia, uh, we were connecting to Turkey. When we were doing this border crossing between Tajik and Afghan, there were challenges. And uh, you know that time, even uh, relationship between Uzbek and Tajik was also not good at that particular moment. In 2010, I am talking about when the uh, hydro station issue has come. So uh, it, it is there. What I'm trying to say, connectivity uh, should be ensured. Free movement of the people should be there. Uh, policy advocacy, think tank movement should continue. And the people who have experience of the region, who understand the region very well, should be involved more and more in the policy making. So the challenges which have been faced can be overcome and it can be dealt in a very strong way. That is the suggestion from my side. And I wish uh, things will surely improve. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, and uh, what we have heard from the speakers, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Beglia could not join. I think he would add also a lot of uh, good ideas uh, for, for our session. Uh, but uh, despite the fact uh, uh, that uh, there is no common border between Greater Caspian region and India, we have so close ties uh, in economy, uh, in culture, in education, in medicine, and so on. 
and uh, we really have a lot of things to develop. And uh, key is important that should be joint efforts uh, from the governments, from the private business, uh, from the associations. Like uh, I, I'm very glad uh, to hear the, about the activity of the Confederation of Indian Industries uh, because they are really, uh, they are really taken into consideration and mitigated properly. Uh, and, and, and Gunnar, I think we're already closing the session, just in several seconds. Uh, and uh, this is a good uh, role model for other countries, like CII is operating in India. And I already spoke during the last days with the several top managers in the CII, uh, several vice chair chairmen. And I think this model we could implement in the region. Uh, and uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your ideas. And special thanks for the Dr. Frank Richter, chairman of Horasis, to providing this opportunity to meet and discuss, although virtually. And we all hope for the restarting the live real meetings in the very nearest future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.